done for Well, I'm going to get started because I think we've got a pretty full agenda today, and I'm sure we'll be capturing a few more people as we go. So thanks for coming in our March PIC meeting. Um, I think we have one more to go this year, and if you recall, we've been covering a number of different topics throughout the year, and um, we've got a number of guests to speak to you today, maybe the largest audience we've had to speak to you, but um, really exciting partnership program that we've entered um, at Center Park and expanding to some of our other schools, and it kind of fits under the whole piece where we've been trying to work with um, more teaching of the whole child. Um, maybe um, you could also talk about interventions for our students and providing our teachers with more skill sets and intervening with some of our students who need those pieces of it. And so I'm pretty excited about what I've learned about this partnership in RISE that was created um, through a partnership at Center Park. And so from there, I'm going to let Ann Shuffler take the lead on this and introduce the rest of your folks and mm -hmm. go from there. Thank you. So I'm Ann Sheffer, I'm the MTSS coordinator for the district. Um, and just kind of as Mike alluded, we are taking a look now at whole child and really focusing in not only on academics, but the behavioral and social and emotional needs and well-being of our students as well. Um, and all of this does fit under an MTSS model. So an MTSS is a multi-tiered system of supports. And, and we're really kind of building this system as we're going. Um, we have a couple of different initiatives that are happening in our district. One of them um, is with RISE, and Sarah's going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, we also have student support specialists that have been hired, and so Christy Hainstock is one of our student support specialists. Um, Debbie Winstone is the other one. And we also have school mental health providers at our secondary level, really making sure that we're um, honing in on the well-being of our students um, socially, emotionally, mentally, behaviorally. So a little bit of background as to why we are here now. Um, we've seen an increase in the amount and intensity of behaviors of our students over the last few years. Um, again, not the inability to self-regulate um, and just kind of bring them back down with their emotions and with their behavior. So that requires us to take a look not only at treating the symptom, but understanding the root cause and knowing behavior is a form of communication, so kind of what our students are needing. Um, so we're doing that with these different initiatives, but understanding too that we're also learning and, and getting the professional learning for our staff along the way. So that's kind of why we're here today. So I'm going to turn it over to Sarah Owens, who's going to talk to you about the RISE program. Thank you. How's everybody doing? Good. I'm going to move maybe a little bit, but I was told that I had to stay a little bit in one spot because we're being recorded. So, um, But like a lot of conversations that I like to have is I want this to be a little bit of a volley. So we're going to move really fast. We have a lot of information and not um, that we want to be able to fit in. So I'm going to go through a little bit of what RISE is and why and what it looks like. And then um, we're going to hear a few stories from some of the staff from Central Park, which is our home base currently for RISE. Okay, so, but if you have any questions at any time, feel free to raise your hand and we'll get those answered. Okay? Um, so to begin with, what is RISE and what do we believe? So this gives a little bit of a foundation for you to understand why are we doing this work or sort of what's the heartbeat of what it is that we're doing. Um, Dr. Ross Green, I don't know if anyone's familiar with him, but he talks about that kids do well if they can. So if kids aren't doing well, something's getting in their way. And it's up, to, it's up to us to figure out what that is so we can help remove that barrier. This idea that kids innately are motivated to do well in the context that they're in. We all do. And so we've added in there even teachers and families do well if they can. And if they're not doing well, something's getting in their way. And it's up to us to figure out what that is. Um, stressed brains can't learn or teach. So part of RISE is really looking at resiliency in students and in educators because we know that our educators are the intervention. If our educators are stressed and burnt out, it all stops. So no matter what tools we put in their toolbox or what strategies they're using, if they're in a state of chaos or stress, they're not going to be able to connect and teach kids. So they have to be just a part of this equation. So we've learned that stress brains can't learn or teach or connect. We're going to get into that one specifically uh, this afternoon. Stress is inevitable, and we have to learn how to take care of it. So that goes back to that first one a little bit. If I can't stress manage myself, if I don't know how to manage the big stress or the big upset that I feel, then I'm not going to be able to do what I need to do in order to take care of that. I have to have direct instruction on how to manage that. 
even adults sometimes have to have direct instruction on how do we manage stress. Um, protective factors trump risk factors. So we're going to talk a little bit about that stress can create a variety of risk factors. We all are aware of what those could look like, what those could look like. But we also recognize that resiliency research says that when we have protective factors to help buffer those risk factors, we're able to do a whole lot of good stuff. And so we recognize part of our work is to not just try and eliminate those risk factors, although that's a part of it. We have to figure out how to tip the scale with protective factors. Learning happens over time in the context of safe, attuned relationships. So just like math, kids aren't going to have one lesson and know how to do double addition. They're going to need it exposed multiple times. That's how learning works. And so learning how to manage my stress is the same way. Um, and then finally, resiliency is rooted in supporting the whole child, which um, you heard a little bit about. We'll look about what is whole child. What does that really even mean, at least from the RISE perspective? Um, so what does whole child mean? We recognize that there are multiple components to what makes up um, a child. And so when we think about um, healthy development of attachment, stress management, and self-regulation, without these um, sort of like building blocks, we're not able to be ready for school to have uh, curiosity, to have self-direction, to be independent. And so how is our um, healthy development and school readiness, how does that impact our learning in the classroom? And so part of supporting the whole child is to recognize we have to address um, the components of academics, but we also have to address the components of stress management, attachment, and what does that do for my, um, my neurobiology, and what does it do for my stress response system? And so this idea that whole child is a part of all the components of what makes up development. Another component of whole child um, is looking at the systems that surround it. And so schools and communities are complex systems. So one of the things that RISE really tries to address is that this isn't a quick fix. This isn't a simple answer. These are complex systems that have to have complex systems around them to support it. So when we look at the student is going to be affected by the educator, and the educator and student relationship is going to be affected by the educator's well-being in isolation, and the school's interaction with the educator is going to impact the student and the family and the community. So the components that you see on the outside of this slide are on the outside for a reason, because they don't fit in just one spot. The way that the community impacts the student has just as much to do with the way that community and the educator are impacted. And so that these components are intertwined. And when we look at supporting the whole child, not only do we support them on the micro level of thinking about how it was their attachment, how was their um, healthy brain development, their healthy immune system development, what did that look like as they start to grow and learn those baseline skills, but also, what were the systems around them that is supporting them? And if we want to support the student, we have to support the educator. And if we want to support the student, we have to support the school system. And so these in isolation and together is what makes up supporting the whole child. <clears throat> So this is a little bit about RISE. So from those two components, um, we have um, sort of these like five pillars or foundations that everything we do goes back to. So this notion that um, we have to understand the science of understanding development, the science of understanding stress, and what does that do to the brain and body. Um, we have to understand the components of relationships. And really by relationships, we even mean attachment. The difference between relationship and attachment, attachment are those that like component that actually releases different chemicals in the brain. This idea that if I feel safe and attuned and I have attachment, different parts of my brain are gonna be activated. So helping um, kids and teachers to understand the difference between those two. Uh, looking at self-care. We've talked about that if educators are dysregulated, they're not going to be as productive in the classroom. And so how are we helping them not just like take a bath at the end of the week or go for a run, but how when in the moment in the classroom when there's so many things going on and they're holding space for so many different components, how are we making sure that they're regulated? How are we making sure that they're able to respond in an attuned and a caring way? Um, systems, we've just looked at that slide in terms of the systems that surround them and we have to address all of them. RISE is not a component that just goes in, works with the teacher one-on-one -on -one, and then exits. We look at the whole system that's surrounding that building and that district, that community. 
Um, and then policy and advocacy. How do we begin to, to share this work? How do we begin to advocate for things that are outside of the district's um, control? Things like the teacher-student ratio or things like um, the uh, different laws that are coming down that are impacting our communities and where funding's coming from. That has to be part of the conversation too. So everything that we do goes back to those five foundations and we support those in two ways. Professional learning for the educator and then um, resources that are more direct to the student. So professional learning, we have components that help us look at our policies and practices and this continuum of being resilient. What things are we doing right now that are resilient and why are they working and how do we hone into that and understand that? Um, one of the things that we talk about is that this isn't something new this isn't something to add to your plate. This is rather something to just a lens in which to view what it is you're already doing and how do we help adjust or either increase the work that's happening. Um, resource problem solving, so we come together and we look at, you know, I'm having um, this challenge or this barrier is continuing to get in my way. How can we problem solve around that? And then growing knowledge, just continuing to help educators understand the science behind the, uh, what it is that we're talking about. Then resources, so in tandem, because we talked about learning happens over time and in the context of relationships. If I download a bunch of great information into a teacher's mind and she's like, yes, or he's like, yes, that sounds great, and then they go back to the classroom and they're hit with like system barriers or they're hit with an overwhelmingly amount of things that they're having to address, all that's going to go out the window. None of that's going to be able to transfer. And so how do we provide coaching support? So we go into the classrooms and we say, pause right here. Remember when we talked about this last week in professional learning? How does that apply in this moment? And we walk that through that. We walk that through that with them. Structured reflection um, is a piece where educators are able to come together and they just sort of process. So that's that just educator um, ring that we saw. How is this impacting my life at home? How is, this, how is my job impacting the things that um, I want to do within my family? How is, it, how, how, how is my role at home impacting me as an educator, both good and bad? And we just sort of process that to make sure that we're balanced and that we're attuned to what our needs are so that way we can be the best version of ourselves in the classroom. And then well-being mindfulness um, is another component. When we think about mindfulness, that might be a buzzword right now. A lot of people might hear what that word is, and they might have different definitions of it. So a quick definition of mindfulness for us is really that notion of attunement. What's happening right now, in this moment, and what do you need? So just that bringing back to the present. And it's one of a, the things that I think even as a culture, adults don't even know how to do. Like as I'm talking, you probably have bounced to something either that you had to do before you got here or something that you have to do when you leave here or you're thinking, so I said something that made you think about something and you've just rabbit trailed away from me. You were able to bring it back because you have a strong prefrontal cortex, but kids who don't have that strong prefrontal cortex yet to be able to say, hey, woohoo, she's talking to me. I have to come back to this space right here. They stay in that wandering. And we know that when we're stressed, our brain does that faster and it stays there longer. And so how do we start to help kids to pay attention? Instead of just telling them, pay attention, pay attention, pay attention, how are we helping them practice their pay attention muscle? How do we bring that into actual practice? And that's the piece that um, that component does. And also with the educators. Yes? E-E-A-N, well-being. Well-being. So that is um, a part of a... Um, collaboration that we have. It's actually a company. You could look it up. Yep, yep, yep. It's the name of a company. Yes. Yes. Well-being. It's a play on words. Well-being. Well-being. Planting the seeds of wellness. Thank you for identifying that. Okay, we're moving. I'm keeping an eye on the clock. Um, okay, so when we talk about one of the components that we talk about with schools is that we don't have the answer for you. I don't have an answer for you. I don't, have, I don't know your building, I don't know your students, I don't know your staff. I'm a part of the Midland community, I live in Midland, so I can identify some components to that, but we are not here to provide you the answer. We are here to help you think about what is important to you, what is important to your school, to your building, to your families, to your students, and how can we help to start to identify tenets or things that have to be rooted in whichever sort of direction or things that you want to employ. So those um, tenets that we advocate for is this notion of attunement. So again, back to this idea of how attuned are we to ourselves? 
So when I start to, I have uh, two kids, Ivy, who is three, and Jameson, who is five. Um, he's going to be six. So when I'm cooking dinner, and I'm starting, and I got a phone call that I have to, and I see emails coming up, and Jameson's at my shoulder, at my you know side, like, mama, 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 how attuned am I in that moment so that I don't turn to him and react out of a moment of stress, but to be able to say, whew, I have a lot going on right now. How, how attuned am I to being able to attune to him, attune to dinner, attune to, to the things that are also calling for my attention? And how do I allow myself to be able to choose versus react? How do I respond versus react? So we have attunement to ourselves. We have attunement to students. So if a student is starting to become dysregulated, how attuned am I to that? How can I predict sort of he's starting to get overstressed? I can see that. So we're going to pull back a little bit, and we're going to sort of fuel up before we come back to this activity. How attuned am I to my students? And how attuned are students to themselves? So those are the components of attunement. Attachment, again, we talked about this at the beginning, but that's really going back to this notion of being so connected to something that the chemicals like the joy juices in my brain are actually released. And that's what helps to build these um, brain pathways. So when we think about if there was a big snowstorm that came, and if I had to make my way to the end of the driveway to get to the mailbox, and I made my way back, that first time is a lot of work. But now I have a little path, right? And I might try and fit my feet into those footsteps that I made the first time. But eventually, over time, it creates a pathway. And that's what happens in our brain. And so when I have strong attachment, that's what helps those pathways to be formed. And so this notion of how do we create attachment neural pathways that will open up uh, the capacity for learning. And then the middle component is safety. And when we talk about safety, we want to really talk about a felt sense of safety that's very different than a head knowledge version of safety. How do I feel? Do I feel safe? Um, and we'll talk about this in a moment, but this really is for all kids. It's not just kids who maybe have experienced adversity or kids who are currently struggling, but really for all kids. Um, and there's three elements to that, physical safety, emotional safety, and psychological safety. So it's not just I'm safe within my building. I know no one's going to you know, hurt me here. But how am I feeling safe emotionally? How am I feeling safe psychologically? What does that look like? So we break down all those components down and really look at those at a deeper level. So attunement, attachment, and safety. So no matter what a school does, we'll come to them and we'll say, great, let's take that strategy or that practice apart and let's look at how is it identifying attunement? How is it identifying attachment? And how is it creating a felt sense of safety? So those three things are going to be looked at. Questions so far? We're really cruising. OK. So the why. Stress brains can't learn, teach, or connect. So we're just gonna, I'm just going to give you a really sh um, small glimpse into the why this has to be part of the discussion. And you'll see a little bit of the components that the uh, staff receives and even the kids receive. <clears throat> so we'll teach kids about their brain. Because a lot of times, if I've never been taught about my brain or if I've never been taught about my nervous system and I get big upset and I'm sort of expected to control that and I don't even understand what's happening within me, that can be a very, very scary feeling. Um, particularly if I'm compared to a student that might be able to regulate themselves easier. And so this notion of like, oh, I like the way so-and-so sitting. Jimmy, you need to be able. And he's like, I got big feelings right now, and I don't understand them. So we teach kids about their brain. Um, this is an image from Wellbeing, so from the company that talks about the mindfulness uh, piece. Um, and we teach them really um, three parts of their brain for right now. We're just going to, I'm going to teach you two parts about your brain. Hold up your hand. You have a model of the brain with you. It's called the hand model. It's perfect, right? So tuck your thumb in. This is going to be the mid part of your brain. So this is the amygdala, which is like your fire alarm. So if you, this is your fear center. Your emotions are also held here. So if something were to go off, like if all of a sudden I were to act startled or scared and I started backing up, you probably would look around and look at the doors, right? Your amygdala is going to tell you to do that. You don't have to consciously think, oh, she looks like she might be feeling a little bit upset or scared. I should respond. You just respond, right? So um, that's that, that part of your brain. We call this the watchdog. What does the watchdog do? What is the purpose of a watchdog? Guard. Yeah, to guard, to protect you, to keep you safe, right? But sometimes the watchdog barks at the mailman. Sometimes he barks and he alerts you and you don't really need to be alerted. So that's that part of the brain. Fold your fingers over top. 
This is your prefrontal cortex, right? So this is the part of the brain where you can have impulse control. You can compare and contrast. You can understand time. You can do all the things we want kids to be able to do in school. This is called the wise owl. The wise owl part of your brain has big eyes, and it can look around, and it can make um, wise choices for what you need, and it, can, it knows all the things. When the watchdog barks, the wise owl flies away. And literally, we'll teach kids what happens is, when you have a moment of threat, your um, amygdala actually sends certain chemicals to your prefrontal cortex that tells it to stop thinking. Stop thinking. Because if there was something and you were really in danger, you don't need to compare and contrast and think. You need to respond, and you need to respond fast. And so that's what's happening with kids, is their sort of wise owl is flying away. This, also, this is the part that also holds language. So when kids are really upset and they're not either making sense or they're not able to tell you what's wrong, it's literally because they're offline. We would call it offline. We call this flipping our lid. So this idea that the part of the brain that holds all the things that we need kids to be able to do in school actually goes offline. So part of it is thinking about how do we stay online? How do we start to be able to stay online? Now you know a little bit about your brain. OK, so, but stress is inevitable. Those are part of the original belief statement. Stress is inevitable. There's different forms of stress. Positive stress, some stress is good. I'm a little stressed right now as I was coming here a little bit, right? I'm a little nervous. I could feel my heart rate kind of increased a little bit more. I'm a, but I'm, that helps me to be focused, right? That's a positive element of stress. Tolerable stress and toxic stress. Tolerable stress is maybe when I go through something that's a little bit beyond that positive stress. It might last a little bit longer, but there's no real long-term effects. Toxic stress is when we start to see effects. Um, so we have these um, different waves that will sort of come and go um, throughout the day. We um, Maybe trying to get out the door, we're running a little bit late, I realize I left my coffee on the table, I'm dropping the kid off, he made it, whew, okay. I went up a little bit, but I'm able to come back down. We have these um, two components of our stress window, or a window of tolerance. Most people experience stress throughout the day that ebbs and flows, right? You feel stressed, and then it kind of comes back down, and then something else may happen, but it kind of comes back down, and it stays within this window of tolerance. What starts to happen is when we have chronic elements of stress, we maybe get to work, and we stay up here all day. We never really come back down. And then what happens is either we crash when we get home, or we stay up here and we can never tune it out. Maybe we don't really sleep well at night. Maybe we don't really eat well. Maybe there's different components to that. We don't really come back down. And what can happen is that our sort of like chemical dances, so this is like the rest and digest, and this is kind of like fight and flight, both of them are good. Both of them serve an important purpose. But what happens is they get out of whack. And our rest and digest either overactivates, and we have kids who sleep all the time, who seem so disconnected, who um, struggle with empathy or caring, or we have kids who are in flight and flight. And so it's a real chemical um, component that their stress dance is kind of off. And what we know is that chronic stress that's not buffered has both short-term and long-term effects. Short-term effects are going to be things like, I'm impulsive. I can't process consequences. You understand a little bit because I'm living here. I come into school like this. This part of my brain is driving me the majority of the day. My watchdog. I'm constantly looking for threats. And that's going to, re that's going to um, signify different chemicals in my body. Adrenaline and cortisol, mostly. Um, I have big, frequent upset. I'm irrational. I can't process things. So things like, um, I never get to eat at school. And you're like, you just ate 20 minutes ago. And they're like, ah! Like, what? he just ate 20 minutes ago. It doesn't, he's, think, he's thinking from here. It's not rational. He's not, that part of his brain isn't being activated. Um, low memory and focus. I can't process sequencing. So kids will re go to retell an event, and it's all out of whack. And we might look at that and think that it's lying. But really, we understand that understanding time and sequence is this part of the brain. And if I'm having to recall something when I was here, I wasn't activating the part of the brain that can store that correctly. That also goes into my school, the way that I understand academics. Um, and I live in the here and now. Probably less than three seconds out is all I can perceive. So things like, you know that re extra recess we were working for towards the end of the day doesn't matter to me when I'm in this place. I can't process that. It doesn't connect to where I'm at right now. Um, 
healthy brain. These are the things that we really want to see from our kids. But we have to understand what part of the brain can activate this, what part of the brain this comes from, and how do we strengthen that part of the brain. This isn't something we can motivate into kids. This isn't something that we can reward them into. It has to be practiced, and it has to be thought of from a, a brain and nervous system component. There was a study, we're going to talk about this very, very briefly, but there was a study called the ACE study. How many people have ever heard of the ACE study? OK, a few of you. Um, that really just started to look at, we know that chronic stress that's not buffered has both short-term and long-term effects. The ACE study was done in the 90s, and it really looked at certain childhood experiences that may have created chronic stress and what those health outcomes are for those kids as adults. And it's really quite staggering. I don't want to stay here, because whenever we present on this, there's always people who are part of the audience who connect with this. One in four people have, a, have an ACE score. Um, and when we talk about an ACE score, there were 10 things that were identified in this study. We know that there's a lot more than just 10, but the study focused on 10. 10 things that, um, or events that you may have experienced as a child that impacts your health as an adult. One in four. And when we really look at, um, when we really look at the components of what starts to happen with that and how, what this study did was really help us to understand that toxic stress that's not buffered really does change our brain and our body. And we can see that even into adult. So if this is interests you, um, you can look up the ACE study. There's lots of information out there. But the main takeaway from this is this notion of stress impacts and changes our brains and our body. Um, we're going to spend um, the last little bit here looking at the resilience research, though. So this is coming from the um, ACE uh, science. So what, what the ACE study told us about neurology and what it told us about how we can pass those components down generationally and um, some of those things that I think we've always kind of known, but now we have the science to help us identify the why. Um, it also talks about that resilience research shows that our brains are plastic and our bodies can heal through implementing protective factors and resilience building practices. So again, that comment about risk factors and protective factors, protective factors trump risk factors. So even if you have a high ACE score, if you have lots of protective factors around you, you're going to be able to buffer that. And that's our goal for our kids. Um, what are protective factors? We have individual strengths and we have environmental supports. And so um, what those can look like is intelligence. There's some protective factors that are just innate within us that we don't necessarily, we can't necessarily change, but we can sure target and highlight to sort of um, increase the effects of those. Um, capacity for emotional regulation. We saw that as one of the building blocks from that um, first slide. The presence of social supports provided by caring, competent adults, that's that attachment component. Positive belief about oneself. When you think about, um, has anyone ever read the Berenstein Bears uh, Strangers book? OK, you kind of know what I'm talking about. That scene where like, the bear's kind of looking around, and everything looks like gray and shadowy, and it just looks really scary. And then the next page is in color, and it's really just like the town. When we have experienced certain elements of, of chaos or stress or unpredictability, that's the way in which our brain forces us, because we're living from this part of our brain, forces us to look at the whole world. And so helping kids to understand what is their self-concept, what is their belief about oneself. Belief of the safety and fairness of the situation. Again, belief of the safety, that felt sense of belief. And then a motivation to act effectively. Motivation requires a lot of this part of the brain. And if I live in this part of the brain, I'm not able to access it. So how do we start to help kids to have motivation based on these components? So really, RISE helps schools and um, educators and families and communities begin to shift from this idea of what is wrong with you, or what can I do to stop this behavior or eliminate this behavior? And we're going to shift it to, I wonder what's happening within you. I wonder what maybe happened to you. And what can I do to build protective factors? No longer thinking about, we just need to end this behavior. Or we just need to stop this. Or we just need to, there's something wrong with you. I want to motivate this out of you or punish this out of you. To really shifting. It's a big mind shift to thinking about, I wonder what's happening within your system or happened to you that is, that's manifesting itself in this way. And then what can I do to help build protective factors to help buffer that? Not get rid of it, but help buffer it. 
because we know that that's the resilience research. That's the component that's going to help you to be, become a healthy adult. OK, wow, <laughs> we did it. Um, OK, so here's just a couple quotes from some of the um, staff in your district that has experienced um, the different elements of RISE. Um, this is 100% a, a of teachers reported well-being mindfulness, increased students' ability to relate to one another, pay attention, control impulses, and regulate emotions. That's a whole lot of protective factors we're putting in kids' toolboxes. <clears throat> All of this is from a teacher. All of the sessions were extremely informational and beneficial. I'm already changing the way in which I see my kids and are making adjustments to how I respond. And that goes back to that mind shift, right? That idea of like really thinking about how are you viewing this? Well, how are you viewing the systems? How are you viewing this behavior? How are you um, viewing this child? I realize that not all student that all students benefit from this, not just the ones that have a known trauma background. We think about uh, stress is inevitable. So while some of these practices are going to be helping kids who have experienced stress or are currently experiencing stress, or we're doing preventative work for one day when that stress comes, they're going to be equipped. So it's supporting all kids. I'm absolutely loving my experience. I feel it has made it such a difference in myself, first and foremost, which in turn is making me a better teacher. And that's that component of teachers are our intervention. No matter what they employ, no matter what strategy we teach them, no matter what professional development we send them to, their connection, their attunement and attachment with our students is what brings the space for learning. And if they're not well, it all stops. So we have to take care of our teachers. And by teachers, even thinking about our administrators, our district leaders, we're all holding space in that component, right? So we have to take care of all of them. So I have a couple friends with me who are going to share a little bit about their experience um, with RISE. So you don't have to go in this order. We're all going to come up together. Great. <laughs> Next question first. Yes. So in your uh, diagram there where you showed the students and teachers yes. and all that, yeah. uh, there, and I, I'm assuming you direct this typically towards schools. Yes. But there wasn't one for parents and home life. Yes. And I go, this is great. But to, Put this entirely on the school staff. Okay, I go, I go there we go. Right here. Yes. Very Absolutely. And family, yep, and families up there. And the reason why it's not a ring of none of itself is because the educator's family life impacts the student. The student's family impacts the, so the reason why it doesn't have its own ring is because it's so weaved into this in terms of maybe what I'm hearing you ask in terms of like how do we educate our parents about this more. That is, um, we did do a wonderful um, parent night at CPE um, and we talked about understanding um, like the brain states and when your kid flips, your, flips his lid or as a parent you flip your lid, what can you do in that moment? And it was a great, um, very well attended and the feedback was wonderful. So more components of that. Is that what you're asking? That is what you're asking. Um, at the end of this, sorry y'all, um, I have Ann's email address. If you would like more information about this or thinking about how can we get this information, because you're absolutely right. Parents are just as much as the intervention as the educators. And so how do we equip you and help you to be able to understand this and your girl? OK, okay. come on up. All right. Hi, I'm Shannon Blazy. I'm the principal at Central Park Elementary, and um, I have some teachers um, that I brought along with me. Um, and I, I was asked today. We were asked today to just explain our journey with Rise, and um, our journey began last year. Um, we had our uh, Sarah Owens um, and um, a few other people from Saginaw Valley, and this year we have the addition of Kim Prime coming into our building. And specifically last year, they worked with eight teachers, and it was like a cohort. And throughout the year, they would learn the well-being, and they would go in to the classroom 
and do specific coaching, in the moment kind of coaching, to help um, really show the teachers, how do we apply this? We can talk all day about it, but when you're dealing with the kids in the moment, how does that really work and how does it look like and what is the teacher really doing and the student reacting? So um, then we did, um, we're doing the same thing again. This year we have another group of eight um, that they're working with and they work with administrators because administrators face uh, some of the same situations that, um, that our teachers do. Um, we're interacting with the students when they're in crisis mode and um, it's been really amazing to see, to, for me to step back and reflect on how I approach a situation and problem solving with students, especially in crisis. Um, I'll give you a quick story, um, really brief, but um, I've had a couple of situations where maybe a student would be under the table in my office, screaming and crying, kind of a thing. So, um, you know, through some guidance, it's really about mimicking the child and where they're at and showing them that I'm here for you, but maybe it's not even talking to them. You're just mimicking what their body and nonverbals might be doing, the good part. So, for example, if the child is under the table, I might sit on the floor and then um, I would give them time and space. I wouldn't even be talking to them. I wouldn't be asking them questions and peppering them with, well, well, did this happen? Did that happen? Or are you okay with that? Or, you know, trying to understand it and uncover um, what the situation was. Just give time and space. And then I might scooch a little closer. And then I might reach out my hand. Just simply... Literally, this is, I mean, I watched Sarah do this, and it was, it's just the simplest thing, but it works. Just putting my hand out in a closer proximity so that they can see, this is my way of saying, I see you, and I'm here for you when you're ready. And I wouldn't even necessarily say that. And then I can see them just starting to relax their body, um, and then they're starting to go from that watchdog moment into being able to process and then I might say, okay, are you ready to talk? Are you okay? Yeah, I'm okay. Okay, let's, let's see. It, show me you're okay by coming out from under the table. Okay, so you know, or giving some indication. And then we can start processing. We got the watchdog out of the way. The wise owl has come back. So that's part of how I have been practicing, although um, I, I'm not perfect at this, but I'm, I'm learning. It's a journey, and, and you know, we want to build capacity in our school and our district for being able to um, be able to reflect on how we do things and make it better and understand our students that have trauma or, as you said, Sarah, building the resiliency in students that don't have trauma so when they have a tough moment in life, they, they know other ways to handle it. So, um, and then who would like to go next? I get to go, okay. I get to go first. Um, so just a couple of instances, things that I noticed when I was going through training. I went through training last year. Um, I have been teaching for 20 years. I've always thought about connecting with my kids. I've always built great relationships with my kids. And last year I ran into some stress. <laughs> so thankfully Shannon got me on, you know, in the Jill Rise program and I learned a ton about why kids not why, but when they react, how do we react to them? Um, one of the things that really made an effect, and I teach five-year-olds, I teach kindergartners. One of the things that really helped me understand was the whole watchdog, wise owl stuff. And five-year-olds can understand that. They can understand when they flip their lid that the guard dog is out and I'm reacting to something and I need to figure out if I need that guard dog out or if that guard dog doesn't need to be out. It was just a false alarm. And we talk in those terms to them and they get it. Or I can say to them, oh, is that your guard dog reacting? Do you need that here? And they can process through that and say, oh, wait, no, maybe not. Maybe I'm not really in a bad situation. Um, the mindfulness idea is how to help them when they have reacted, how to help them to get back to the wise owl was really helpful. We have lots of breathing techniques that we did. Um, just being in tune to what your body is doing. Um, being aware of the breath going in and out of your body um, was important for them just to kind of sit and feel. Um, I also very much appreciated the professional discussions that we had um, because it is stressful for me, myself, and how I bring that stuff home. 
um, is hard. I have two kids at home too, but they don't deserve stressed out mom because of the day I had at school. They deserve a mom who's ready to, they're teenagers so they don't play, but <laughs> they deserve a mom who's there for them and is ready to listen to them and hear their stories and help them deal with stress. Not the mom that came home and was like, oh my gosh, I just need you know, time to decompress. Um, and then the other thing that I would say is just the support with um, Sarah being able to come in. Um, the, I'm thinking of all the discussions we had about the stress that's in our lives. And sometimes just sharing that stress helps you to deal with it a little better. So I appreciated all of that. And I had Christina go first because as I was brainstorming, I had like a huge list. And I said, Christina, you go first so I don't repeat everything that you said because it's so good. Um, but I have been in the district 28 years. And I feel like this has been one of the best initiatives in the district because it builds that wraparound services, I feel, because they're touching the students, the teachers, the administrators, as well as the families. I know you were asking about the families. One nice thing is when those people were coming in and from the well-being and showing us different uh, mindfulness techniques, they actually came in and modeled, and I was one of the students with my students, and we were learning together. But then every week, I would send home a newsletter letting the parents know, this is a technique we learned this week. And lots of parents applied those at home. It was like, can you send us more of these ideas? It's really helpful. So connecting parents that way, they were really appreciative about knowing about those mindfulness, mindfulness techniques. So that's one way. Um, but I do feel it's the best initiative because you just don't realize the impact that we as teachers have. I guess we do, but in some respects, um, that role model. And I know sometimes we get that stressed. And just, I think it was last week, I told the kids, I went home and I felt bad because I just felt like I wasn't the role model I wanted to be to them. And I came back the next day when we had our morning meeting. We always talk about some things. And that day I asked them, what's one thing you worry about? And they were all talking and it just gave me an insight into what does worry them. But then I share with them, like, I just felt really bad yesterday how I acted in class. I should have never done that. Adults shouldn't do that. You, you know, I'm going to try better next time. And we had this discussion. And this little girl came up to me. She's like, Mrs. Holman, we forgive you. But it was just like, you know, we have to admit when we do something wrong, too, and let them know adults shouldn't do this, and I'm very sorry. So I think it's just that relationship and letting them know I'm trying to learn things, too, and be less stressful. But in the moment, just like parents, we sometimes do or say things that we don't want to say. Same time in the classroom. And I think I've grown that way because I've had less. And since I've talked to the kid, I've been more conscious of it, not that I Try not try to be, but I try to be more conscious of what I say and do because I am a role model to those students. So that's really important to me, and they have taught me that because of that watchdog and all that chemistry in our brain. You know, we are human too, but I have to let the students know that it's okay to make mistakes, and you know they have no control when they're doing this. And like she said, that language they totally, totally get that, and. Um, Going back to the mindfulness note, because that's kind of what I was talking about, was um, I used to not have that in my classroom, like a time for mindfulness. And after our meetings, I put mindfulness in my schedule, like on the board. And um, the kids, some, one day I forgot it, and they're like, this is holy, where's the mindfulness? And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Like, they need that. They want that in the schedule. And it's not just, we do it at that time, but if I see the kids starting to get like a little more edgy or just that heightened emotion you start to see, I may just say, okay, we're just gonna stop right now and do some deep breathing. I need it right now. And sometimes it is me that might need it, not the kids. And I'm being honest with them because I wanna model for them like, when you're feeling this way, it's okay to just stop and do some of these mindful techniques that they taught us. So they get to choose. We have so many that they can choose what they wanna do at that time. So like for three minutes, we might do that. And then we're like, okay, let's go back to reading now or whatever we were doing. And it's just a big game changer because I found when I don't like take that time when I start to see that heightened energy, it ends up going to be more of a tornado <laughs> than I wanted it to be. Or if I took those three minutes, it ended up having me more time to actually do the lesson and to teach than if I would have not stopped and thought, I got to get this lesson done, I got to get this lesson done. No, we need to help those students like realize what feelings they're having and help them get it back under control before they can actually take it in because if they're here, they're not going to listen to my lesson anyhow. 
because their wise owl isn't there that they're where they're thinking. So those are lots of the big things I talked about. I would like to say one more thing. Do I have time? <laughs> Is that colleague support. Um, like Christina was saying, we have time to, we have small group sessions professionally, but also a time for reflection. And that has been huge because it's helped with my self-care and my mental capacity because it also builds like relationships with people in my building that I don't even have time to build relationships with because you're in your room and you're crazy and they're in their room and you try to eat, talk together at lunch, but life's so busy. Where this time, I actually know like Christina wasn't in mine because I'm in this year's group, but if I was with Christina's group, I would actually know what's going on in Christina's life. And we can talk together and build relationship. And she can maybe will stop down and see me and say, hey, how's it going? I know you talked about this, this, and this. Can I help you with that? Or, so it's just helping the team members in our building build connections as well and support. So I find that to be extremely huge, too, because it makes us a stronger unit at Central Park as well. And I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> and I've seen Lisa take those pauses in her classroom, and it's pretty amazing. So um, my name is Katie Hilliard. I'm one of the family intervention specialists at Central Park. Um, I'm a social worker by trade. This is my 18th year in social work, my fifth year with Midland Public Schools. Um, so the bulk of my career was actually spent working with children and families in the foster care system. So um, I'm not a stranger to behavior being a form of communication um, for both families and children. Um, so in my uh, job here at Central Park, I, I consider it an um, opportunity and a privilege to um, support not only the students, but the staff as well as the families as best as I can. So um, the benefits I've seen from RISE are just that common language and that knowledge base to bring to our entire staff so we can be um, working with our students and families and our staff um, together uh, with the same understanding. And um, I find that knowledge of brain states to be um, absolutely imperative. Um, so I'm constantly thinking about where am I at? Where, are, where is the staff at? Where are the students at? Um, and without that, I, I don't feel like I would be able to do my job effectively. So um, to me, I, I think this just really kind of brings all of those things together. Um, I personally utilize this information in my um, group work with students, my individual work with students, and, um, and in my support, hopefully, um, with the staff um, to, to just kind of together develop an understanding and making sure that we're all being kind of acutely aware of that and we're being as mindful as possible when we're responding to whatever situation that we need to respond to. Um, so uh, I, I had the opportunity of participating in the RISE trainings last year as well. And um, it's, it's, I love talking to kids about their brains. Um, I love talking to families about their brains. Um, it's, it's a great conversation. I use the kid-friendly language. And for those students who are interested, they find it um, really amazing to be able to pronounce the words prefrontal cortex um, and memorize that as well as amygdala. So um, we talk about all of those things. And it's just it's something that I integrate into um, my daily work um, every day. Are there any um, 12.45? We couldn't have been more perfect. <laughs> All right. Wow. Yes. We did it. Is there, are there any questions? The last 15 minutes. Bigger questions. What, what's next? What's so, next? This, this is one, one school in Boston School mm -hmm. District. Because um, I tried to bring well-being to Adams okay. PTO, and it was a cost that wasn't. wasn't so that may be my question. So um, I think we've already, we began to expand slowly, so I kind of believe we'll go slow to go fast. Mm -hmm. And so if we don't get buy-in, which sounds like we got some buy-in from staff, and um, to move forward, um, that um, we have to have that. And so the last two, three, four months, Sarah's been educating our entire administrative group to get the buy-in that we need to move forward. And um, from there, we're going to focus on the elementary schools. You can add anything you want here. Oh, you're you mic'd up, I'm not. You, it's okay. Would you like my mic? No, that's not Okay. Right. No. Yeah, you don't know me well enough to know that. That's probably my least favorite part of Right, <laughs> right. Speaking in front of people. Um, but we, then, we, then we may expand to the secondary schools, but we really believe early inter intervention, the earliest, and start there anyway. And so um, that's kind of our thought at this process right now. So we, 
We would like if they have the capacity. And you remember, there's, there's just a little bit of capacity. We're, we're certainly hogging a lot of time. And they work with others, too, um, besides the the public. But we're going to try to continue to expand this as we go forward. Um, and, and, and maybe I tie into Ann <laughs> and, and the whole thing. And so, you know, two or three, you said it well in the beginning. Two or three years ago, we really noticed, I've been doing this a long time, and we really begin to notice a shift. And it's not, and I hear people say we have more of these issues. And I say it's deeper. And deeper and different than I've ever seen. And so, and I would go out to staff lunches, and this group would be one that would tell me when we opened Central Park, Mr. Cheryl, you don't understand, you don't understand, you don't understand. And I'd walk out, and these guys would come, I'd come back, and they, I'd vent to them, and, they, and we all began to explore about what are we going to do. So hence why Central Park was our first focus. From there, I mean, um, we're spending resources like crazy, so you said all the positions. So Christy's new in her position, yeah. Ann's new in her position. Debbie's new in her position. Debbie's new in her position. We, we, we've got several new positions to, to, and I sum it up because when I began to play with, we were doing pieces here and there, and I kind of went to Penny, it falls under her category, and said, you know, we're pretty sporadic. We need to figure out how to put this all together because we're getting initiative fatigue. And I often use that with staff. When I do initiative fatigue, I lose them all. They're done. Mm -hmm. Not another thing. Yeah. And so we have to figure out how it fits in everything we are doing. And so MTSS, or the whole child, it fits under that. And so MTS typically is used more about academic intervention. And, and so I'm probably blending the two, but I think we're all on board that it fits all of that, including the whole child. And I don't know if you want to explain Christy's role and all that. Yeah, I mean, we're really looking at supports for students and how some of that becomes then tiered, especially you guys more providing um, individualized you want. supports for kids. You want um, so along with that and kind of building capacity, Debbie and Christy are into their roles, and that um, came from some different funding from MD as well. But we're also trying to say, how are we kind of building those systems, um, knowing that they're kind of stretched to capacity, how can we start to replicate some of that so that we can then build the capacity internally as well? Yeah, just a quick statement. Um, I keep hearing acronyms, and I'm hearing these two whisper over here too. Mm -hmm. um, no, but we don't know what acronyms are. Um, yeah, you got to explain. Oh, that. Uh, yes. Self blah, 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 all <laughs> <laughs> I'm not speaking the yep. parents' language at all. And so if, when they're watching this on video, parents are going to check out because it's like they don't know what those acronyms mean. So just. Just think like that when you're talking to us. Thank you. I'm yes. sorry. No, that's okay. Just, yeah, so, yeah. so Michigan Department of Education, of course, some of this is you know coming from as well. Okay. MTSS is a multi-tiered system of support. Um, it is a fairly newer acronym that's kind of out there, but it has been blended over the past few years. Um, it started with like a response to intervention. What um, is MTSS? Multi-tiered system of support. Thank you very much. Um, so again, how we're meeting the needs, you know, at a universal level, how we have targeted supports in place, and how we may also need um, individualized supports as well. Think of a triangle. So like a triangle is kind of used to be able to say, here's all the kids, here's some of the kids, and then here are, like, are the kids with the most need. And it totally can be academic based in terms of the process of how someone might qualify for special education. Or it might even be our responses to social emotional learning, right? There's some kids that don't need as intense support on how to handle stress as some of the other kids. And so think of it as like a triangle and as you work your way up to the top it becomes more intensive. And for years we've been better at the academic intervention and not so much the other pieces. And, and that has become the newest need and where we've, we've now been able to blend that into the support system as we go forward. And I really like how you said, because it was good, because we tend to focus on our labels, acronyms, at risk, or children of trauma, some of the things we use, but it, this is good for all children. And I just have one more quick feedback back off of your question. Um, one of the components that we really strive is this idea that culture eats strategy for breakfast. So kind of like if we have all these great strategies and if we were to just um, teach teachers in isolation, but the culture of the building still had barriers against that, it all stops. And so thinking about how can we both bring in sort of responsive in the moment support and then also look at, like um, Mr. Charles said, supporting administration. And so thinking about how do we help administration to understand this so that when something like well-being comes in, the culture is able to absorb it and is working towards the same goal. You know, along that line, you, you know there's a teacher shortage, educator shortage. 
And um, that burnout is real. And where does burnout really come from? And, and burnout comes from frustration of doing the same thing over and over and over with no result. And so we, you know, we real, have recognized that and began to look at it. And a couple of these people talked about, maybe it was you, Christine, talked about stage in your career. And there's literally studies out there that kind of say there's these key stages in your career where you hit this. And, you know, I don't remember the ages, but it's like, you know, you're three or four, all that fresh, I'm going to come in, I'm going to change the world, and then the reality hits in. And then, again, about seven or 20 out, you know, and, and we have to, if you last as long as I have, you've changed your color five or six times and figured out how to, do, how to stay, stay with it. You built grit, which mm -hmm. was part of that resiliency. I use grit. I think it's some of the same. We build it, but we also build it within our students. Well, I was just going to say one of the most powerful things that I heard today was two teachers who have been teaching for more than 20 years saying this was one of the most effective things that they've ever done. And that's huge. That's huge. Mm -hmm. This makes a really big difference for kids and teachers. Mm -hmm. What does Fry stand for? Resiliency uh -huh. in students and educators. Oh, beautiful. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So clarification, so is all of Central Park School now doing this? Are all teachers? So that's not, so that's a great question. And it's complex because, you know, the, the, the system around that is complex. So we've had two groups of teachers that have sort of gone through the whole component of it. So they've received the coaching and the learning. Um, and so I think we have 16 total. Um, and then we're... We have 30 gen ed teachers, but we also have about seven special, uh, sorry, seven um, specials teachers, and then we have six special ed teachers, and then we have additional staff that support. Are so, care pros a part of that? Or? In some cases, they, mm -hmm. they have been. One of the things that we one of the things that we strive for is how to build capacity from within, because it can't be up to us to train everybody. It really has to be building capacity from within, and that's why we have to include administrators. So if a teacher that's not part of Rise comes into the office to see um, you know office support or to see a principal, and that teacher has an experience that um, Shannon is going to be able to serve as a coach to be able to say, let's think about the, the brain state of this kiddo right now. Let's think about, and so she would indirectly be teaching that, that teacher if she hasn't been part of the full, he or she hasn't been part of the full program. Yes, but the, she said it well. So an organization of 550 full-time employees, but 1,100 total employees with a 20% changeover um, semester, you must build that structure within to train the trainer and then the culture portion of it that becomes who we are. So everything we do, when you talk about PD, we cannot do one-time initiatives and say everyone's trained, it's fixed. Mm -hmm. It has to become systematic and cultural. But is there an opportunity for a teacher who's not a part of this, who's one of the other 15 teachers, to become a part of that? That's the goal, and it's building the capacity to get there. Mm -hmm. So right, so right now, our last professional learning um, for the teachers that are in this core group are going to be how can next year you start to share this with your coworkers, and we're going to start specifically helping them to be able to say how can you share your experience, and that was part of why we had them come today. In terms of they're the they are holders of this information, they have stories to tell, and they have this knowledge. How do we start practicing them sharing that out? checks on that and says, indeed, within this year, these teachers did share what they know, yes. rather than to have the beam not be watered and die on the vine. Yes, so we have um, different, we had um, each group set objectives, that part of that coaching component is we check in with them on their objectives. How are we meeting this? What does this look like? What is evidence of this? Um, and then coming back to, we have a school-wide assessment. So coming back to the, at the end of the year, that assessment to be able to say, have we moved in this component? So we um, together, RISE and MPS. Yep, yep, thank you for your questions. Yes? It's more of a statement. This is like me and Tanya's fourth or fifth year being part of PIC, uh, and we love this. Um, and some of the questions that are being asked were along the lines of things we asked our first couple of years when you guys had introduced a new program and we were like, well, how are you going to pull all this off? And now that we've been here four or five years, we've watched you guys pull these things off um, and, and do it in a way that is 
mimicking what you're doing here, that you're rolling it out in one school, you're introducing it to people, you're getting teacher buy-in and then moving it out. Um, I've become fiercely defensive of this school board because I've watched, it, and the administrators here, because I've watched what you've done over the last five years and I've watched you say you're going to do them and then implement them and do them. And when people are just seeing this from the outskirts and not watching the story all the way through, they're missing some of the pieces and not realizing how well this is really being done right now. And I, and I just wanted to throw that out for people who might be newer to the PIC meetings and not get to see, have seen all those parts unfold yet. But it's it's impressive. What? I'm proud to be part of this school district. Yeah, well, thank you. Well, well that's not really <laughs> Um, but with that too, I think part of it is that this is unique and that it's not like taking an English language arts thing and teaching them how, how to do a new teaching strategy. It's really looking at diving into like much deeper components of even themselves and even the way that, so this is human work not necessarily academic work. And so it's deep and it's hard work, but it's work worth doing. And so when we look at the, the length that it takes, it takes researchers showing three to five years because there's these huge components where they'll kind of get a little taste and then it feels like they're drinking from a hose, right? Because there's just so much and they're thinking about their own kids and their own childhood and their own backgrounds and how that's influencing it. And then we move forward and then there's another huge wave of, so it's, um, there's a book out there called The Deepest Well that talks about ACEs and understanding this. And it's the deepest well because when you think you hit the bottom, you just realized you got way more to go. So so I think we're at the end of the taping. We'll stay around and ask, ask questions. One of the things I'll tell you that um, when you talk about the district, and some of you have been here a lot longer than me, know we're very, very blessed. I, I say it all the time. For the most part, parents send us some incredible raw product to work with and then we get incredible supports to help us do what we're doing and, and SVU has been a great partner in our venture on, on Central Park as a whole from the early days when we talked about a STEM elementary school to partner in this so we thank them for all their support that we continue to get from SVSU as well but we'll make sure you understand we are the district we are because of all those other pieces of that. What can what I, I work with child trauma myself, and I see these kind of programs, how much of an investment they are in our communities, and, and the long-term social and economic payoff to our communities. So, what can we do as parents, or as PTOs, or as other groups to help support this, so that it does get into more schools at that early level? So I think we all kind of want So I think I heard you say earlier, don't react, respond. And so I think I need time to answer that. But the best I can tell you is um, right now, um, spread the word about maybe what work we're trying to do with, with those children. And um, we certainly right now have the, the economic resources to do what we want to do. But when we come and ask you, and we were very cautious about when we come and ask the community for supports, and so when we do, it's often at times where we don't have economic resources to do so. Um, the other one is I think um, we're still exploring that parental component on this. I think that question has come a couple, a couple times, and I think I actually said it to Sarah just a week ago, is how do, how do we educate parents? Because you're part of that team, a very vital piece of that team. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I don't know if I have the right answer for you right now. In terms of at least this, helping to share that, you know, to have them watch this and then to maybe have start to gain um, a list of parents that do want to become involved. And I think once we have demonstrated an interest, then we have reason to create, you know, meetings and create workshops and create. Well, we'll stop the taping and thank you for attending. Stay around. We'll ask any, have any discussion you would like to have from there. <laughs>